Welcome to the Changemakers podcast produced by City Current. I'm your host, Jeremy Park. We're honored to be with Nancy Murphy. She is the founder and president of CSR Communications and creator of Entrepreneurs Influence Lab. And when we talk about creating change, you can do it as an entrepreneur, but you can also do it inside an organization as an entrepreneur. So we're going to talk about what that means and explore this world of internal change that leads to external difference making, empowering the good. Let's start though, Nancy, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Boy, your enthusiasm is contagious. I love it. Hey, this is a very important topic and it's something that when you talk about making a difference and looking at it from that lens, being able to understand the power that lies within an organization is extremely important. And so the fun of Changemakers though, is we get to know you personally, we get to know where, you know, on your end, where all of this started. And so let's go ahead and dive in. Give us a little bit of just where you grew up and Talk about your childhood. Well, I grew up in the Midwest in Columbus, Ohio. So I often say I'm a Midwest girl at heart, even though I've been in the DC area for 26 years now and have lived here longer than anywhere else. My parents refuse to accept that that means this could be home now. But so yeah, I grew up in Columbus. I'm the oldest of four girls. And I spent uh, a lot of time as a child and young adult in Catholic schools. So that definitely shaped a big part of who I am from first grade all the way through college. So went to Minnesota for grad school after that. And then um, oddly in high school, I, I decided I wanted to be a lobbyist. I don't even remember how I knew what that was or why I thought that would be appealing, but I knew I always wanted to be in the DC area. I'm really a policy junkie more than a politics junkie, um, but really love sort of being here at the, the center of where policy change happens and where we can really influence the world as a result. Share, because as you mentioned, you know, being one of, of four daughters, um, you on your end always kind of wanted to push the narrative a little bit in terms of like Catholic school and creating change and not accepting the normal stereotypes. And so share a little bit of just that perspective of wanting to create your own identity and do things a little different, but also to look at social justice in a way. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting that you put the social justice piece in there at the end, because that was where when I was in college anyway, the, um, you know, the, the social justice aspects of Catholicism really spoke to me, the, um, the theology that was really around the poor and the disenfranchised and our responsibility to agitate on their behalf and advocate on their behalf. But that wasn't always the Catholic Church that I experienced. So you know, I would say probably being the oldest child, um, I was always a little bit of a status quo challenger. And that's why I can relate to some of those intrapreneurs who are seen as the troublemakers <laughs> and not the problem solvers that they want to be. But yeah, I, in my Catholic grade school, we had, uh, when I was in seventh grade, we had this, um, we called it the Great Wall of Pylons where the teachers decided the girls were too much of a distraction and a temptation for the boys at recess. So they separated us <laughs> with this wall of pylons. And at the same time, the boys were being recruited to one of the, all, the only all boys Catholic high school in the area. And the messages that they were getting were, well, if you go to the co-ed high school, you know, the girls will be a distraction in the classroom. You won't be able to focus. And I thought, wait a minute, <laughs> who says girls are a distraction when the boys are the ones causing trouble most of the time in the classroom? And you mean to tell me we're not adding anything to the conversation or the learning environment? So very early on, I started asking those questions and, you know, raising perhaps a counter point of view and wondering why it was that those were the messages not only the girls were getting, but also the boys. And how was that going to shape their view of females, you know, going forward? So, yeah, I've always been a little bit of an agitator, I guess. Hey, that's good. But it's good to look back and realize this has been a common thread throughout. And this is what is creating these opportunities now as an adult. How much of that came from your parents? Were they supportive? Did they see this as, oh, Nancy, don't, don't go causing trouble? How, how did they fuel the fire? Or, or what was that like on the parents' side? 
Well, so my parents were, you know, relatively young, probably, I guess, not at the time when they had me, but they were in theory, like children of the 60s, right? Like the, they were in their their 20s, teens, late teens, early 20s, and kind of that 60s time period that I was always fascinated with as a young child, right? Imagine the, um, the Vietnam War protests and the civil rights protests and like marching in the streets. And, <laughs> and I think my parents were just totally oblivious to that. <laughs> so I always wondered how come they weren't shaped by that? Um, I think part of it was, you know, the environment they grew up in and then they started having kids. And so their lives were totally focused on other things. So I wouldn't say they weren't supportive um, because I always felt that um, that I was encouraged not only by my parents, but, you know, when I think of some women who shaped my view of possibility for me early on, it was both of my grandmothers. So my paternal grandmother went to college in the depression at a time when women did not go to college, especially then. And she always believed education was important. So even though she went to church, as did my dad, you know, six or seven days a week and really believed in the institution and structure of that, um, I always felt like she made every possibility open to me. You know, my, I never thought that I wouldn't go to college or I wouldn't have a career, even though everyone around me was getting married and having children right out, right after college. So yeah, I would say they were um, tolerant <laughs> and supportive in many ways. So give me one family tradition that stands out to you. Well, so I guess, you know, I'll stick with the Catholic school theme for a while. I mean, Sunday mass for sure was a tradition. Um, as I got a little older, it became Saturday evening mass because I sang in the folk group and that was the mass that we sang at and, you know, that kind of thing. But, but that was really, we lived a couple of blocks from the church. That was where we went to school. That was where all of our family friends and you know kids friends were and so a lot of it centered around that kind of ritual and then you know hanging out in the parking lot after and visiting with people or going down to the church basement and having coffee um, and so that yeah that's a tradition that was definitely a big part of my life and I've kind of carried that forward now, even though I'm not a practicing Catholic anymore. I have my, I call it my Sunday mass of the mind where I go for a long walk. I listen to some podcasts. I do some reading or journaling or meditation. And I sort of have my own mass of the mind on Sunday mornings. So you mentioned always wanting to uh, go into lobbying or at a, at a young age, go into uh, being a lobbyist. Give us a little bit of just the corporate background on your end, because you've had a wide variety of opportunities and careers when you look at working in foundations, working with government entities, corporations, now being a speaker as well. You know, you, you cover a lot of bandwidth. So give us a little bit of the career trajectory on that side. Well, in addition to being a, thinking I wanted to be a lobbyist, when I was in grad school, I was working on the Clinton campaign and doing some work in Minnesota around national service that eventually became AmeriCorps when, when Clinton was elected. And so at that point, I knew I was going to come to D.C. I got a job in the Clinton administration with the AmeriCorps program, and I thought I would spend the rest of my career in federal government. I am a firm believer in the role of government. I thought that was the opportunity to do the most good at the biggest scale. And after about two years, I realized my personality does not fit. <laughs> I was that entrepreneur. I was looking around going, wait, why do we do things this way? And saying to my colleagues, I think we should be able to put ourselves out of business because if this just becomes the way of doing things, right? We don't need to have separate money or a whole separate agency. Like we wanna embed this in the fabric of our whole nation. And so I, and I had that entrepreneurial mindset, you know, but inside the bureaucracy of the federal government. So after about three years, I thought, maybe this is not the best environment for me. So where else can I go? Um, and I, I have lots of interests. I have, um, 
lots of things. I, I'm a generalist, I guess, in a lot of ways. And so I sort of kept finding myself in these change agent roles <laughs> inside, you know, philanthropy or inside a philanthropic association um, where I was even hired to be that change agent. But I was still learning the skills of how to be the entrepreneur effectively you know, how to get people to listen to what I had to say and to be open to the change. And so I was finding myself similar to the leaders I work with now, kind of after a few years bumping up against that frustration, beating my head against the wall so many times that I thought, well, they're not really open to change. I'm going to leave and go find the next opportunity. Um, and it wasn't, you know, until I finally had that aha well, now I figured out how to do this. Now I've had success after a while. And then I get bored once we've achieved the change, right? I'm ready to move on. That I thought maybe the best opportunity for me now, because I've been in all these different sectors and in all these different organizations, I can be that translator, you know, between government and private sector, between philanthropy and nonprofits. And I've learned how to lead change effectively maybe I should start teaching others how to do the same thing and not keep all these lessons to myself anymore. So how do you define entrepreneur? Let's start there and then we'll kind of work our way through. So how do you define entrepreneur? So an entrepreneur to me is someone who is leading big change within an established organization to make it more innovative, equitable, efficient, effective. So they're taking that creativity, that innovation, that status quo challenging mindset that we often see in entrepreneurs, but rather than starting their own thing to disrupt whatever that industry or that, um, that sector is, they're doing it from within the organization so that they can leverage the scale, the reach, the resources, the expertise, the talent to have bigger impact faster. Walk us through the balancing act, because I think this is important because you mentioned sometimes the entrepreneur is seen as the agitator, which can butt heads against those who are not just trying to maintain status quo, because I think many people want to do the right thing. You know, I think people want to do the right thing. They either just are, they, they don't know the, the other ways, the other vantage points. They don't know that can be done differently. They're, yeah. they're kind of, you know, this is the way it's always been done. They're process driven. And then you have the agitator, the entrepreneur that's coming along saying, what about this? What about this? And so in some cases they can be seen as, as a problem versus a problem solver. So share from your perspective that balancing act of coming in and wanting to create change, but doing it in a way that starts to win trust and you're not seen as the enemy within, so to speak. Oh yeah, oh, I love that analogy. Um, so I think one of the very first things that, that I often work with leaders on is this idea of becoming a credible leader of change. And so one of the big mistakes sometimes we make is it does become all about, here's what I need you all to do differently because I see the light and, and you just haven't come around yet, right? When it's way more effective to start with ourselves. So rather than starting with what we need other people to do differently, how can we look in the mirror and say, what kind of leader do I wanna be so that others will follow me? And so part of that is being aware that sometimes our ideas for change have blind spots. Like sometimes not every idea for change is a good thing <laughs> or not every idea for change is viable or viable now or worth the effort and the upheaval, right? That's naturally going to happen. So how can we be aware of that, number one? And then how can we understand that sometimes, like you just said, people pushing back, I mean, I'll call it that versus resistance necessarily, because sometimes it is just a light, like, wait, I, I explain this to me a little bit more. Sometimes that is we're not clearly communicating what it is our vision for change is and why and how that's going to happen. And other times it's, um, you know, there, there are lots of emotions going on behind that resistance. And how can we have empathy? How can we get curious as to what's perhaps underneath that? And maybe it's something we should really be paying attention to 
as opposed to just saying they don't get it, they're laggards, you know, they're, they love the status quo, you know, all of those things that, that we sort of perceive ourselves as the savior in this situation, we're going to come in and get everybody to turn around. So that's a big part of it. Ego is a huge thing to manage and obviously having humility. And, and I look at it too is, you know, to your point, sometimes you come in like a bull in the China shop where you just, you, you want to do all these things and make all these changes. But the reality is you've got to be able to step back and to your point, get people to buy in, but also offer their input so that you're seeing the full picture. Because in many cases, to your point, you're seeing one side of it and understanding it. Anything that looks simple is actually very complex. <laughs> uh, you right. have to understand the complexity and the politics involved with everything that you're trying to do. And I think those are things that having patience and humility and, um, and obviously the ability to engage your team in the right way so that you're not pushing, but you're working together makes yes. a, a big difference in, in creating that internal change and the differences you're trying to make. Um, Share just maybe one example from your perspective of, and, and I'll leave it to you in terms of the right way or the wrong way, but just from your personal experience in terms of, of galvanizing a team, creating change within an organization that leads to the result that you're trying to achieve. So, I mean, I'll, I'll give you one example that um, is a little bit less of a, a team per se and more of how to bring together a variety of organizations and how, how did we have that happen? So um, just because it's one that I learned a lot from and it's one of the things in my own career that I'm proudest of still to this day. And that is um, when 9-11, when the terrorist attacks happened in uh, September 2001, I was working with UPS. They were my client. I was helping them lead their philanthropy and community engagement. And um, they were invested in the volunteerism space. And we saw a whole bunch of people have an emotional reaction to what they saw and wanting to show up at the World Trade Center or here at the Pentagon or in their own communities and do something. And there was very little for people to do in that moment, or they you know, couldn't even safely and securely be on those sites, right? And so anyway, a few months after, um, I had this idea of pulling together FEMA, UPS, and the Points of Light Foundation, which runs all the local volunteer centers across the country, um, to talk about how we could engage what became known as unaffiliated volunteers. So people who weren't part of, you know, the Southern Baptist volunteers who had a contract with FEMA to come in and do feeding, you know, after a disaster. Um, and one of the, the things that surprised me with that is I didn't know there was a history between FEMA and volunteer centers. And, you know, like they had these perception, misperceptions about each other. And they um, weren't sure they wanted to work together. And, you know, FEMA was like, oh, those volunteers are just going to get in the way. They're not going to be helpful. And the points of light was like, hey, we've got all these people. Don't you need help? Come on. So one of the things we did um, in our very first meeting was we created this huge timeline, like butcher paper on the wall, to let people tell the history of their movements, of their organizations, and of their relationship together. So it was that, you know, let's not pretend that there hasn't been some challenges working together. Let's not pretend that there's not expertise and deep experience in some of these areas, right? So it's that one of the challenges we often have in change is people's identity is tied to the status quo. So when we start challenging the status or criticizing the status quo, right, we're challenging their identity. So how do we show appreciation for that? How do we look for the value in that experience and that expertise and what do we wanna carry forward? So in some ways it was a lengthier process than needed to be. I mean, it was a good year of having these conversations, building the trust, letting the relationship evolve before we got to what became you know, a set of practices and protocols and policies for how to engage random unaffiliated volunteers in times of disaster that are still in practice today. 
So 20 years later, almost, I mean, it was worth the effort, but many people I think would not have done that. They would have just wanted to ram it through. Let's get it done. But I saw the opportunity to take advantage of the convening power of UPS to get people to the table and then to create the space to again, let the relationship evolve, honor the history and the, and the experience that people were bringing to the table, get that why confirmed, you know, what's the high level thing, the core values and beliefs that that better world that everybody wants and keep people focused on that rather than starting with the how, because <laughs> that's where everything can kind of fall apart. Um, and so it was worth the effort to get to the result. Well, as you mentioned there, if you don't know your why, you lose your way. And so understanding the why, but as you just mentioned, it's it's relationships. All of this is relationships and trust building. And just like relationships in our lives, they take time to develop. And if you don't look at the long-term perspective, you lose out on the, the long-term staying power of what you're trying to create. Talk about resistance because you've mentioned resistance a few times. And I know that on your end, you talk a lot about the three different types of resistance. So share a little bit of just the three types of resistance and what that looks like. Yeah, so I, I've discovered that there are basically three types. One, I call the what ifers. So these are, you know, it, it tends to be in some of the groups I've been in, like the lawyers, right? They're the people. Who are, but what if we do this and horrible thing happens, right? What if we um, change the way that we uh, work with donors and partners as a nonprofit? And what if our biggest donors walk out the door? Or what if we uh, change our mission slightly and you know, we're no longer relevant in the community? So for those folks, they're expert at those scenario planning. There are Eeyores, there are doomsday folks, right? And so one thing we can do to overcome that type of resistance is people like me, and I think many entrepreneurs, are often overly optimistic. I believe everything's gonna work out okay, which means I probably have some blind spots. So how can we value that insight that those what ifers bring to the table and invite them to do some scenario planning for us, right? Yeah, let's play that out. How likely is that worst case scenario to happen? <laughs> what would we do if it actually did happen? right? Because it probably isn't that likely. And even if it does happen, there's probably a plan we could put in place. So invite them to play to their strength. So the what ifers are one type of resistance. The others are those status quo defenders. These are the people who might have created the policy, the practice, the system, right? That you're trying to now upend and disrupt. And so remember that their identity can be very closely tied to that. And we don't want to get their lizard brain freaking out that fight, flight, or freeze by attacking their identity. So instead, we can invite them to look at the current ways of working or the current plan, practice, policy, whatever it is. And with some clear criteria and parameters, identify those things that we want to carry forward. So as we're leading this change, what do we want to make sure we don't change, right? What do we want to preserve and protect? And the third kind of resistance is what I call the yes, no women or men. So they're the people who sit in our office or in the meeting and shake their head and they're all on board and then they walk out the door and do the complete opposite. <laughs> And there are actually four subtypes to that. I won't go into all of them, but the key factor to distinguish is, is that flip floppy, you know, yes, no, is that a, a result of a lack of will or a lack of way? So is it that we haven't trained them how to work in this new way? They don't have the skills. They're feeling super anxious about it. They really want to do, they have the will to do what it is we're asking them to do, but they don't have the way. They don't have the skills. They don't have the training. So what can we put in place to close that gap? for them. So there's always something we can do. And resistance is not always a bad thing. In many cases, it's a very good thing. It will make us stronger, will make our ideas better, and it will illuminate those blind spots for us. 
I'm glad you mentioned that because that's actually where I was going to go next is when you look at weight training, resistance is what makes you stronger. And so without resistance, you don't get stronger. You don't build your muscles. And so what are the team members that you need to have? So in other words, just like an entrepreneur, you can't do it by yourself. You you need other people to be able to, to bring your idea to life. As an entrepreneur, you need a team to make sure you don't have those blind spots. So of those different categories and just in general, what are the things or the the types of people or or who who do you need to have as your team to make sure that as an entrepreneur, you can create the change you need to create? Yeah, that's such an important question because a huge mistake that I see entrepreneurs make all the time is going it alone, thinking they are the sole champion and they're just going to, you know, gut their way through it. And that almost always fails. So The way I think about it is um, one of the tools that I I teach my leaders is a um, kind of a status map within their organization. So thinking about, there are lots of different layers to think about who you need on your team. But one way to think about it is who has influence in the organization, even if they don't have formal authority. So you you wanna be looking for who has formal authority Um, and high influence, who has informal authority and high influence, and how do we enroll those people? If we find folks who have (laughs) low, uh, low influence and little to no authority, and they're the first ones on board with our idea, that might actually not serve us well, right? Because people will go, huh, if, you know, Jose thinks that's great, I'm not sure it's a great idea. But if Juanita thinks it's great, then I'm absolutely going to go for that, right? So who are the cue givers inside our organization and how can we enroll them? And, and thinking about what are the key roles? So who will this change impact most directly? Do I have a representative from that? I kind of think about building almost like a little kitchen cabinet for your change. And we need to have people who will represent the people most impacted by the change. Just like, you know, that, that kind of makes sense in anything you're doing as a leader. Um, who are those cue givers? And who are those people who will complement what it is we bring to the table? So maybe my mindset is one thing and I need a, a complementary mindset, or maybe I'm super optimistic, right? And I need those what ifers at the table. So we don't wanna just bring people who are exactly like us. If I'm a big visionary, great communicator, but I can't make a project plan to save my life, well, eventually you're going to have to implement this change. You better have somebody in your little kitchen cabinet who can answer the how questions once people are bought into the why. Yeah. I love the illustration of the different teammates. And I think, you know, what you're talking about too, just the difference between like the title power versus the influence and the relationship power. Even if you're stepping in as like a new CEO where you're trying to disrupt well, you may have the title power, but you need the relationship, the influencer power. So you've got to have kind of the best of all the worlds. And to your point, even the stakeholders who will be living out that change, you need them on board to build the credibility of what you're trying to do. Um, Talk about shift because on your end, you're putting out a lot of great resources for people. So talk about shift. So shift is something I developed back in April of 2020. Uh, So pretty early on in the pandemic, when as an entrepreneur, you know, I'm on a bunch of people's email lists and, you know, coaches and and everything serving me as an entrepreneur. And I was getting a million emails a day about a five day challenge, a 21 day challenge. And and I was talking to a bunch of my clients and, you know, people in my sphere and and seeing on LinkedIn and whatever. I'm like, don't give me a challenge. <laughs> I, we've all are full of challenges right now. Give me a survival kit. And so I created Shift as a 30-day change leadership survival kit because people who were not natural entrepreneurs who did not want to be leading change were leading change because everyone was experiencing change at that moment. And so everybody needed a survival kit. So I took kind of 
everything that I teach in my influence lab program and everything I work with my clients on. And I tried to find the little nuggets that would be the most practical, relevant, immediately applicable solution to the challenge of the hour, the problem of the moment, <laughs> and put them in three to six minute video lessons that people got via email every day, Monday through Friday for 30 days with a few questions to reflect on and then one action item that they could do. And if it wasn't solving that problem of the hour, it got taken off the list. Don't do a video about it. I mean, it had to be things that were gonna get people through this incredibly um, uncertain, chaotic upheaval. And so we continue to enroll folks in it and it's amazing the feedback that I'm getting from it. So I think it's been a really helpful tool for those people who were leading big change before to be able to figure out how do I keep moving that forward when the whole floor has fallen out from underneath me or for folks who were not really big on leading change, but found themselves trying to get their whole team or their whole organization to work from home, to get used to remote team meetings, to um, you know, engage with clients and customers and donors and partners totally differently than they had before. So that's a little bit about Shift. Where do we go to access that, to learn more, to find Shift? Yeah, so if you go to uh, csrcommunications.com forward slash shift, you can find it there. Um, we've also got a bunch of other tools and um, like a, a strategy quick start three, two, one for how you adapt your strategy in times of crisis. Um, some great free downloads on the freebies tab on the website as well. Talk about one or two of your favorite tips to go from a goal getter versus a goal setter. <laughs> yeah, well, it's really easy for all of us to set goals, right? Um, that's that's what we do every January 1st. We set these intentions. And actually, one of the things we know is that not a lot of people set concrete goals. So that's the first thing. Set a goal, make it concrete. The second thing is write it down. So this is true for ourselves as leaders, as parents, as you know, humans, um, and for our teams and organizations. Do we have clear goals? Are they written down? Do we revisit them on a regular basis? So this is, I think, a big part of where things often fall apart. We create a strategic plan or we set goals for the quarter or for the year, and then we don't use them to make decisions every day. So we have some tools that, that we work with leaders on to get super clear on what we're gonna stop doing so that we can make space to do the things that will help us achieve our goals. What are those things? And how do we align all of our resource decisions to achieve those goals? And by all of our resource decisions, I mean not just money, but time, and energy. So for example, I have a tool that I use for myself called the weekly catalyst. And every Sunday after my mass of the mind, I sit down and do my weekly planning and I spend some time with my long-term vision for this company, for my business, for the entrepreneurs I serve. I look at my um, goals for the year. I look at my priorities for this quarter. And then I plan out my week so that I'm aligning my time with those things. You know, every quarter, my team and I check in. What's working? What's not working? Where do we need to adjust? What's changed in the world? This is the other big thing. When things change in the world or inside our organizations, right? We just lost a big client or a, t a team member left or there's a global pandemic. Oh, well, I don't, I'm just going to get into this spinny energy and like check email all day long. So I feel busy, but I'm not actually driving toward anything. How do we have intentional revisiting and realignment so that we're shifting based on what's changed in the world, but we're doing it intentionally. We're not just sort of letting things happen. So those are some of my big tips. Yeah, I think it's so easy to be busy, like you mentioned, versus to be productive. And there's a big difference. And so to your point, being able to prioritize what's important and to have the regular checkpoints, but also to be able to look at, okay, 
is this really moving the needle? Is this really productive versus are we just kind of spinning our wheels and just being busy? Um, you've had a chance to work in all these different sectors between government, as you mentioned, foundations, corporate CSR. Give us a, a highlight, if you will, of the differences, because I think each one of those different, and obviously it's going to vary company to company and foundation to foundation, but in general, I think that's an interesting vantage point to work within these different entities and to see how they view creating change and then how that ultimately changed your perspective on foundation giving and the difference making, mm -hmm. government, business. Give us a little bit of just what you saw for the differences or similarities and then how that kind of changed your vantage point for being able to make a difference. I'm just curious. So I think I'll come at that in a few different ways. One, back in 2016, because I had done so many of these kind of cross-sector partnerships and I had worked in all these different sectors, I was getting really frustrated that people coming to the table in these partnerships were making all sorts of assumptions about the other entities and teams based on their tax status or based on, right? So you're, oh, they're from a government agency. Oh, that's gonna be so slow, lots of bureaucracy, you know, all these, or yeah, well, you know, those corporate folks, they're just gonna wanna slap their brand on everything and, you know, right? And what I had discovered through a lot of, work and conversations and then did some some research around was that it has much more to do with the mindset of the organization than their tax status. So we created these four types of cross-sector partnerships based on our partners based on psychographics. So what are the dreams, desires, fears, anxieties, motivations of an organization coming to a partnership? And are they a traditionalist or are they a solution seeker? And very different. So I think, first of all, I would encourage folks to look beyond the tax status of the organization to really understand what is the motivation for that organization for anything they do, right? And it's those psychographics that are gonna be very different. The other thing I would say is when it comes to entrepreneurship and change, there is way more that is similar across organizations. I mean, I'm always surprised. I hear the same challenges across all these different sectors. I have the same tools and approaches that will work. Sometimes the language is slightly different, right? Are you talking about customers and clients or beneficiaries or stakeholders? Or are you talking about profit or are you talking about general operating support? Are you talking about, right? So the, sometimes the language, but that's a very surface thing. I mean, one of the, the core uh, barriers oftentimes to change, which is common across all these organizations is something I call artifacts. So what are all those little things we leave behind that tell us what, what really matters, what we really value around here, that indicates how things really get done, right? That reinforce the old ways of thinking or working. And if we don't get our teams on a scavenger hunt and find all those artifacts and prioritize which ones we wanna you know, get rid of first or which ones we have control over, replacing? And what are the new artifacts we're going to lay down <laughs> next? What are we going to leave behind that reinforce the new ways of doing things or the new ways of thinking? Then we're, we're going to create this unnecessary friction or people aren't going to believe us when we talk about the change, right? Because it's like, but wait, all the systems over here reinforce something totally different. You're making this way too hard, or I really don't believe that this is what we mean. And I see this as a big one right now when so many organizations, again, philanthropy is, is doing this, nonprofits, the private sector around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we can make all the policy changes we want and put all the big commitments out there. But if we've got all these artifacts left behind around hiring practices, around um, team meeting culture, around you know all sorts of things that reinforce the opposite of inclusion and valuing differences, 
then we're probably not going to see the change we want inside our organizations. And that's consistent no matter what sector you're in. Yeah, I love being unscripted because it's like, I didn't even, you know, you don't know going in the questions you're going to ask, but I'm really glad I asked that question because um, I love your answer on this. And I, it leads me to the next one, which is give me one bit of advice when you look at identifying the artifacts and recognizing that within your own institution. Like, I think that's the hardest part to your point is, okay, we've got this baggage we're bringing along. We've got this razor blade suitcase of all these experiences <laughs> in the past that's, that's causing us harm to go where we need to go. How do we recognize that and, and take ownership of it to really, and, and this actually does go into entrepreneurship, everything we're talking about, because yeah. identifying it and creating that internal change to actually change it, that's, it ties in perfectly. But, but give me one bit of advice to, identify the artifact and, and do something about it. Well, this is where don't go it alone comes in again, right? So I guarantee you the people who you're asking to change will tell you what the artifacts are. <laughs> so, I mean, first of all, use the language, you know, make it okay for people to flag those things for you. In fact, invite them to, right? So just even calling that out. It might be really hard for us as leaders to see everything, particularly if we're talking about large organizations, right? So like I work with a company that does facilities management and food service, um, like running, uh, you know, campus cafeterias and things around the world. So you've got a person sitting at headquarters leading sustainability efforts who doesn't know what the chefs and the frontline operators are facing, you know, thousands of miles away, right? But I guarantee you, if she pulled together a group of chefs and said, hey, what's getting in the way of eliminating food waste? Or what's getting in the way of us taking single use plastics off the table for, you know, th they will tell you what's getting in the way. Oh, the fact that we don't have any um, suppliers in our portal that we can buy from for the things that aren't single use plastics. Oh, well, duh, right? So have those like fix-ins, invite people to go on scavenger hunts. What's getting in the way? Oh, okay, is that something we have direct control over? If not, can we influence it? How much leverage would we get if we were able to remove that artifact and lay down a new one? Let's make that change first. This is one of those conversations we could go on and on for hours and, uh, and I would love every second of it, but we're gonna go ahead and wrap up with what we call a lightning round and it's just short questions, short answers, just to have some fun. And so first one is, what's a recent book you've read? Oh my goodness. Well, uh, Jeremy, hi, my name's Nancy and I'm a book addict. So <laughs> you don't wanna see my house at this moment. I, at any given time, am easily in the middle of 10 books. So it's a problem. Um, but like one that I just have pulled out again recently is Decisive by Chip and Dan Heath. I'm a big fan of the Heath brothers and I was recommending that to a client uh, who's trying to change the culture inside her organization. And I felt like there were some of the tools in there. So I was like, you know what? I should read that book again. So that's one that's been on the, the top of my desk for the last week or so. What do you like to do to relax? Outside of the meditation. Yeah. So I do like my mass of the mind. You know, I'm a big podcast fan. So I'm so excited to be subscribed to yours now and to uh, hear some of the great folks you've chatted with. Um, I also really love running, yoga. You know, my social life is all wrapped up in my physical fitness life. And so that is a lot of what I do to relax and, and really anything outdoors, you know, hiking, being on or near the water. Those things are always peaceful to me. Are you more productive at night or in the morning? Oh, definitely in the morning. I, uh, I'm one of those early bird people and by nine, nine 30 at night, I'm like ready to, to be in bed. So what on your end, when you look at a hobby or something that keeps you grounded outside of the running, what's something different that's either artistic or fun or music, but that keeps you grounded? Oh, well, one thing I'm missing so much amidst the pandemic is live music. I mean, I definitely love to go um, see new bands, you know, small venues, not like the big stadium things. I'm all about small venues, local bands, a lot of folk music, and I love to dance. And I love to dance and see live music with my sisters 
who are all in Ohio. So I'm also missing that a lot right now. Yeah. All right. So if we go to Washington, D.C., what are some things that we have to do and places we have to eat once everything gets back to normal? Oh, my goodness. Well, uh, I'm not the best foodie, so I don't. Well, OK, one of my favorite places to eat. Oh, and this is making me miss my dear friend who when she comes to visit, we always go there. So I'm vegetarian um, and there is uh, uh, an Indian restaurant. They actually have two locations called Rasika. R-A-S-I-K-A. And they have amazing kind of high-end Indian food that's kind of a little fusion. Um, and there's one near Chinatown in DC and there's one near in the West End near kind of George Washington University. Delicious. I love that. And then if we are visiting, what are some of the places that we need to go? And it doesn't have to be the standard answers, but where, where would a local go in Washington, DC to enjoy just the, the community? Well, so, I mean, I think that, yeah, a lot of times people overlook the neighborhoods and I would say, you know, hop on the subway, get off somewhere and walk at least a mile in the other direction, you know, just to sort of explore and, um, and see what's there because we all know kind of the federal city, we call it. Um, but one of my favorite things to do is to start on the Virginia side of the river and run along the river, go across the Memorial Bridge to the Lincoln Memorial early in the morning as the sun's coming up and run to the top of the stairs and look out over the National Mall. I mean, that never gets old, ever. It is one of just the most awe-inspiring things to do. Um, and I love the FDR Memorial that has water running through it. And it's just such a peaceful place to be when it's not, you know, cherry blossom time. But <laughs> so those are two of my typical, you know, touristy things to do. But also, yeah, just explore, explore the neighborhoods for sure. Outside of D.C., where is a place that you enjoy going? Hmm. Well, all my family is still in Columbus. And so I do love going back there and, uh, and seeing them and seeing my nieces and nephews and getting to hang out and see how much it's changed since I grew up there. And I've been really fortunate to travel to some unusual and amazing places around the world. So I would say it's a little bit less of like where I love to go back to and more of what I can't wait to explore next. So um, I did, I went to Morocco for my 50th birthday a few years ago and promised my niece that I would take her back upon her college graduation, which is next year. So I have a feeling that I'll be going back to Morocco next year for sure. Very cool. Give us a quote. It doesn't have to be, you know, verbatim, but give us a quote or something that inspires you. Well, for the last probably four or five years, a mantra, I guess, that has been driving me is always in beta. So I am definitely a recovering perfectionist. And for me, the always in beta mantra, I've actually got it hanging up here in my, in my office. Um, that's a good reminder to like, I'm always learning. I'm always improving, right? Try something out, experiment with it, play with it. If it doesn't work, what did I learn? Okay, let's do a little better next time. So Always in beta is definitely a mantra for me. I like that. That's good. All right. So last question. You are creating your legacy every single day, but um, you know, many, many years from now, what do you hope your legacy is? Hmm. Well, I am fortunate in that I really do believe that serving entrepreneurs is my life's work. It's something I have a lot of fun doing and who doesn't appreciate getting to do something every day that you enjoy and that you love. And I think for me, the legacy part of that is all of the change that the people I'm supporting are leading, that if they realize their vision inside an organization that already has massive reach and massive scale, like think of the better world that we could have. Like, I don't want to wait until 2030 to have zero hunger, right? I want to have that next year. And so <laughs> if I can be some little part of supporting an internal change agent to flip that switch faster, to realize that vision faster, 
then, I mean, that's the world I want to leave behind. So, yeah. Wrap up. You mentioned it already, but mentioned again, uh, website, social media, where do we go to follow your efforts and be in the know all about Nancy Murphy? (laughs) <laughs> well, definitely check out the website, csrcommunications.com. And I hope you'll follow me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active there. I share a lot of um, two-minute tip videos and some other great content. So please follow me there. Well, Nancy, you are a change maker. It's an honor to have you on the show. Thank you so much for all you do and for being a part of the Changemakers podcast. Thanks, Jeremy. This was fun.